So about a year ago now, I took on the challenge to learn Rust. My plan was to read through a bit of the Rust book, which I did, do a couple of challenges, which I did, and ultimately complete every single day of Advent of Code, which, may I remind you, is right around the corner. With this year having 12 total puzzles, not sponsored by the way, it's just... I'd like to give credit where credit is due, and big thanks to Eric Wassel for putting this together for over a decade now. However, last year I did not complete Advent of Code. December was a lot busier than I thought it was going to be, which is, you know, partially a reason, partially an excuse, but regardless of what it is, here we are. So I've spent a good amount of time this year really trying to learn Rust, building a couple things, and really just learning how Rust works. And let me tell you, in a recent video I may have said I like Java because it's pretty explicit and specific when comparing it to many of these other languages. <laughs> Java's got nothing on Rust in that department. Rust makes you do everything which is awesome and even a bit romantic for a while uh, until it isn't. So I've kind of let my Rust development fall by the wayside, but what I've noticed is that a handful of lessons that I've pulled from Rust can help me be a better programmer in some of these other languages. And this isn't on purpose. This is just kind of like when I think about how I would do it in Rust when I'm coding Java or TypeScript, I think this could be done better or it just gives me a general understanding of what's going on under the hood, like with the garbage collector or what have you. Or in other words, Rust changed the way I think about programming. Coming from Java or TypeScript, I really had to think directly about memory. Of course, you're cognizant of it in one way or another, but you have the JVM and Node and the browser all handling allocation and cleanup for me, which personally I think is great most of the time because you get to focus more time on features and less time on freeing pointers. But Rust doesn't let you ignore it. And instead of throwing manual malloc free at you, it gives you a structured story. Every value has an owner and there are strict rules for when that owner can lend it out. I remember when I first saw this, I thought, why do I have to borrow? Why can't I just pass it? I know that's how Rust does it, but what's the real reason why Rust does it? Well, it's exactly what's most talked about in regards to Rust, and that is um memory safety. In safe Rust, which is what I'm going to be talking about in this video, because I, I understand unsafe exists, but unless I specify it, we're going to be talking about safe Rust. In safe Rust, the type system ensures that references to a value are always valid and never point to deallocated memory. And this also prevents data races, because in Rust, a value you can only have one mutable reference or multiple immutable references, never both, never two mutable references. So that way you can't have two things referencing a single value and have the ability to modify it. That is the kind of aliasing that leads to data races once threads are involved and the Rust borrow checker prevents that in safe Rust. Okay, I'm done. I'm done mentioning that. So long story long, Rust makes you think about who owns what and when. That's it. So before Rust, my Java code may have looked something like this. You see this value, user. Any caller or reference can mutate it. There's really no clear owner of it here and anything that calls it returns the real object, which works. And it's perfectly fine thanks to the garbage collector, but with the Rust mindset, if you will, my mind thinks to write it a little bit like this. You see here, now there's a single place that owns the mutable state, which is user store, and other layers just borrow read-only views, like user view. That's a very Rust way of thinking applied to Java. When I said Rust changed the way I think about programming, I never said it was a good change. Sometimes it is, but that doesn't mean you always change the code, but instead are, are, are just cognizant of who owns what and when. Luckily, with Java, we have our garbage collector, so we don't need to do all of this. But it does allow me to understand and really picture what the garbage collector actually does for me. Which you know what it does, but you don't always have it in your mind as you're typing out code. Which I think doing so makes you more intentional with your code and allows you to write better code. Or allows me to write better code. I don't know you. Because for me, it changes how I design objects and data flow with that ownership in mind, as well as which values should be mutable and immutable, since in Rust, all bindings are immutable by default, which is definitely a better approach. If I want to change something, I should be forced to specify that something, that value as mutable, not the other way around. Which brings us to borrowing and shared state. 
In TypeScript, I just juggled around mutable state without a second thought. I would pass objects around, have a mutated in place, shared by reference, and I just kind of hoped everything played nice, and if it didn't, then I could fix it then. But in Rust, there, there's no such thing as just hope, and you can interpret that in more ways than one. <laughs> but the borrow checker demands clarity. And I know compile time errors can be very annoying, but not as annoying as runtime errors. And here's the thing. You don't think of runtime er or compile time errors as annoying, but as educational. It's like how people justify losses and saying, oh, the L doesn't stand for loss, it stands for lesson, as long as I learn from it. We're going to take that same mindset here. Because Rust doesn't prevent you from mutating data. We all know that. But it prevents you from pretending you know who controls it. And in Java, I now treat final with a little bit more thought, a little bit more respect, if you will making more things immutable that should be. Not just running it mutable, which is the default and thinking, yeah, well, I probably won't change that. But just in case, I'll leave it mutable. No, 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 the flexibility isn't always a good thing when it comes to this. Strictness oftentimes helps you make the correct decisions, but that's a whole nother rant for another day. And in TypeScript, that means maybe using more read-only arrays, as well as immutability helpers. Again, not because Rust says never mutate, but because it, it kind of showed me how messy shared state actually is. And I know I'm talking about various programming languages, but as many of y'all know, the underlying foundations, the software engineering principles and programming concepts kind of transcend languages, syntax, which is something that Coursera, the sponsor of this portion of today's video, is really good at teaching you among many other things. Like courses from Google, IBM, Vanderbilt, and Deep Learning AI that go over things like prompt engineering. I've discussed it time and time again about how AI can fit into a software development workflow, not take it over as one would do if they're vibe coding. And these Coursera courses allow you to understand more about not only how they're affecting software development and how AI is kind of reshaping software development, but also give you practical hands-on knowledge and actually teach you how to build these smarter systems using AI to code and building things that utilize AI themselves. So start learning all about how AI can help you today as a software developer at Coursera. Future-proof your skills. Use the link in the top of the description. Now, when it comes to types and inference, I try to treat the compiler as a collaborator. I know it's real nice to be able to write code and then you compile it and then there are no errors. You feel like you won something or that something went terribly wrong and it's just not telling you, but you don't have to do that all the time. You can treat the compiler as a collaborator because if you are putting explicit types on every single thing, you're bound to mismatch some types. But if you just let the compiler infer your types, if you just let it check for consistency, well, it helps me prove correctness at compile time. I mean, take a look at this code. Notice how I never once told Rust the type of nums or the type of squares. It inferred it. But in TypeScript, I've seen way too many folks write code like this. Or in Java, which I mentioned in a recent video, write code like this. If you really want to think about it, this is the equivalent of writing a comment saying, this is an array of integers, so that your teammates know that it's an array of integers. It is, by definition, a horrible comment. Because if this is called nums, and we can see the value of it right here. We already know what it is. Same idea with the compiler. Delete this redundant information and just let it infer. And look, I still use explicit types at boundaries, function signatures, public APIs, domain types, things like that. But inside functions, trust the inference system. And I always do this when I'm recording videos. When I'm saying trust the inference system, I am talking to myself what I do. I don't care what you do. You don't have to do any of this. I'm trying to share my experience. I don't know why it's always like, here's a lesson. Eh, silly. But now our beloved error handling. I've written enough Java particularly, as well as TypeScript, that errors love to hide in the strangest of places. Whether it's some sort of no pointer exception at runtime or a rejected promise that nobody awaited, Errors love this, this ambiguity. Rust doesn't do ambiguity. You can't forget to handle an error. You can only decide how to handle the error. Take this result, for example. With the error, 
you can propagate it, you can transform it, or you can explicitly opt out with unwrap or expect. If an error isn't handled properly, that's because you did it on purpose. And in Java and TypeScript, that pushed me toward more explicit failure paths. I mean, <laughs> I know we've all seen a whole bunch of uh, Java code try catch like this, which is just hide the bug and ship it. And it's just littered, but you know, try catch, I like my try catch, as long as you do something a little bit like this. Or maybe instead, depending on the circumstance, you can do something a little bit more like this. And in TypeScript, just, I mean, you just have a bunch of result style patterns instead of <laughs> maybe this throws, maybe it doesn't, I don't know, we'll find out. Or if I wanted to summarize this lesson from Rust, it's if something can fail, make that failure visible. Don't just hide the bug and shift it. Now, concurrency. Look, I've been using synchronized blocks, thread pools, async awaits, and I'm not gonna lie, I kind of got to the point where I just accepted that subtle bugs were part of the game. Maybe a race condition here or there, and I just would fix it when it happened. Look, I get lazy from time to time. I don't know what to tell you. It happens. I would just make it work now and fix the issues later, which I admit is not the best way to go about things, but you could do it that way in other languages. In Rust, you can't. Are you seeing a theme here? It's like Rust is like how uh, drill instructors are portrayed in movies and presumably based on real life. They don't let you do things you want to do. They force you to do the things you have to do. Rust forces you to do what you have to do if you want to write anything in Rust, which is a reason why I would still rather use Java to build any enterprise backend. But let's take that same analogy. Let's think of you're the soldier, you have the drill instructor, and you're being forced to do what you have to do. But imagine you have a good buddy, one that helps you along the way. Now keep that in mind and take a look at this. I can spawn threads with confidence that the compiler will enforce thread safety because ownership and borrowing rules guarantee that no two threads can mutate the same data without synchronization as I mentioned earlier. And that good, that good buddy is, it's a compiler in case you didn't pick that up. And now, even when I write async code in TypeScript or use a completable future in Java, I habitually think in terms of data ownership, not just execution order. Or in other words, less about what runs when and more about who owns the data that's being shared. I also realize that I feel like I'm talking about ownership and borrowing a lot. How about we move over to enums? Rust's famous enums, at least I think they're famous. I heard a lot about them before I started Rust. I don't know if that was, I was in a bubble or what. But in Java, this is where I'd reach for class hierarchies or interfaces to model variants. Or in TypeScript, of course you have discriminated unions. But Rust's enum system, it kind of ruined both of them for me. It, it made me realize that each of them are halfway there. I mean, take a look at this. Every variant is explicit. Every branch must be handled, and the compiler, as always, keeps you honest. And then when it comes to state modeling, you have option and result as ways of modeling state that can't accidentally go invalid. So I took that idea and changed how I model things elsewhere. Here's TypeScript before, which with this, you can get into these weird states if you're not careful, like, like status, idle, error message, oops. <laughs> but if you write TypeScript in Rust style discriminated union, you'd have something like this. Now the shape of the data matches the state it's in, which now when I think about sealed interfaces in Java, I'm thinking like, oh, this is the Rust way of sneaking into the JVM. I don't know if that makes sense now that I say it out loud, but it makes sense to me. I don't know, take that if, you, if, if it helps, take it. And in TypeScript, I think, you know, maybe I should stop leaving default branches in my switch statements and then just let the compiler tell me when I forgot a case. Because again, compiler is your collaborator. You don't have to get it right on the first try. Let the compiler help you. All of this to say, Rust made me stop being lazy. But that really is the theme of what I've taken from Rust. Because with Rust, you can't be lazy. And after using Rust, my standards have changed. It's like it's a form of, form of discipline that I can take into every other language to make my code better in those languages and not just be dependent. Unless it makes sense to be dependent, like on the garbage collector and things of that nature, but it allows you to be cognizant of what's actually happening behind the scenes. All you have to do is learn how to implement these teachings from Rust into the new programming language, but that's the easy part.
And I know what many of y'all are thinking. You don't need to take these teachings into other programming languages because you don't need to use any other programming language. Everything should be written in Rust, but I'm here to tell you not everything needs to be written in Rust, regardless of what you may think. But I do think that every developer could benefit from using a little bit more Rust in how they think. Or not. I don't care. Just have fun with it and code some cool stuff. Y'all have a good one.